I will be giving you a short, uh, very short verse today. Found a very familiar verse. Okay, in fact, it's be found in the TV, in the media, in everything. In Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14, 13 to fourteen. As I read, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, and if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will hear their land. The Scottish poet Robert Burns said it this way, Oh, would some power give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. It means I wish I could have the power to see myself as others see me. It means it is a gift most of us need to receive more often. We all want to believe the best about ourselves. That's natural and even healthy. But it is also healthy to have someone hold the mirror in front of you or face and say, this is what you really look like. It can be a very enlightening experience to all of us. But what is needful for us today is that spiritual progress begins when we see ourselves as God sees us. It's one thing when a friend says to you or when your mother or when your pastor says, says to you, this is what you look like. This is all about you. It, and it's another thing for God to utter those words. Sometimes we can feel, we can even fool our God, or we can even fool our friends, our parents, even our pastors, even our leaders. But, brothers and sisters, it is very impossible okay, to, 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 to fool our God. Because in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He knows what we say behind closed doors. The secret thought that no one else can hear. The hidden motives, the buried ambition in us. And all the twists and even the turns of our sinful nature. He doesn't have to uncover our thoughts and even, or even our minds because he already knows them. Today, let me share with you a sermon entitled, The Reawakening of Our Hearts. The Reawakening of Our Hearts. I suppose no other passage in the Bible has been used more often to preach about reawakening or revival than this verse. It is very familiar, and that is because we are reawakened or revive something when you bring it back to life. Okay? You cannot reawaken something when you bring it back to life. We can't awaken something that has never been alive in the first place. Spiritual renewal, brothers and sisters, awakens the saved. We are the saved from a state of slumber. When God sends His Spirit, the church wakes up. But God tells us that the problem of backsliding and even the sluggishness of our spirit begins with us today and must end with us today. In other words, unless we identify our sins, acknowledge them, and take full responsibility for them, then we have no hope. We will to whom this verse is addressed to, my people who are called by my name. Here, God is speaking to us, to people who have identified themselves with Him and even His work. And these two phrases, my people called by my name, tells us that this verse is limited only to those who know the Lord their God. And God limits this invitation to those who are His people. And who are these people? We are His people. It does not apply to mankind in general. And this promise even applies to those who know Jesus and to no one else. 
To be called by His name of the Lord means to have called upon the name of the Lord and to be saved. This verse was given to Solomon at the dedication of his temple because God had warned the people of Israel that their disobedience to his words and even his commands would bring us or, or would bring with, with its dire consequences. And even in the preceding verse 13 of this chapter, the Lord lays out a certain hard times that might come to the people of Israel. There might be drought, a plague, or an outbreak of diseases in the land. And this verse also is meant for all of us here. Whenever there is trouble in the land, especially nowadays that we are in the pandemic situations, there is trouble in not only in our land, but also in our family, in our city, and even our country. The promise always applies, but in desperate times, brothers and sisters, we need to pay close attention to verse like this. So, I ask you, do you want a reawakened or a revived spiritual lives today? Or what's the condition of your heart? Have we seen our decline? We decline in the past few years and even last year and even today or even months, especially during this time when COVID hit the world and even our church so badly. As a church, do we want to get back to the basics Yes, we have heard so much, so many hard and even deep topics and even sound teaching all these years and months. But all we need today is to go back to the basics of Christianity. Go back to the basics. And there are four messages to my sermon today. First, the reawakening demands conditions. Secondly, the reawakening provides rewards. The reawakening exposes real enemies. And lastly, the reawakening is all realized in Christ. First, reawakening demands conditions. In Second Chronicles, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, how can we prepare our hearts for reawakening, brothers and sisters. Before reawakening can ever become a reality to us, what must we do as people of God? We have to meet the four conditions mentioned in this verse. Let's look at the four things that is required of us to have God takes us out terribly in a desperate situation. First, a call to preparation. Humility. What does humble oneself mean? Sometimes you might think of a man who is standing tall, like me right now, and we have to ask him to fall to the ground and put his face on the dirt at his feet. This is a picture of a man who is bowed down. Humble oneself, however, speaks of the bringing down of the heart and even the spirit of a man. And we will often find a bowing law of a body. But what is most important here is that the lowering of one's view of himself. Even Jesus Christ spoke of the humbling of one's heart as the first step in the kingdom of God. First step in the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What exactly is humility? The word or this word has the idea of being under another. It means this is one of the things that we, God's people, must do remember. Who is Lord in our lives? Humility is when we rightly understand our place and even seeing our true condition before God. It is telling God's way, not our ways. Humility, brothers and sisters, is when we humble ourselves to the Lord, when we acknowledge His Lordship and even His Headship in our lives. We are admitting our weaknesses and reaching out for His power. And we are saying today, I can't, but you can, Lord. 
In Bible times, there are God's people who even demonstrated humility before God by even inflect, inflicting or afflicting their souls in fasting and even bowing down in prayer. In Job chapter 42, when he says, therefore, in Job says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. In Nehemiah, it says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. And I fasted and mourned and prayed before the God of heaven. In Esther, when Mordecai learned of all that he had been done, he even tore his clothes, put on the sackcloth and ashes, and went out in the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Brothers and sisters, God responds to the humble repentance of those who acknowledge him. In fact, those who willingly humble themselves under the hand of God will even open up blessings to come upon their lives. In Matthew, it says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and for those who humble themselves will be exalted. Next, the evidence of humility in our lives is also prayer. And that leads me to my second condition of God. A call to prayer Prayer itself. These words means just what it says. Pray. Just pray. It is in essence humility in action. If you are humble enough, you tend to pray. It is more than asking. Earnestly imploring. Beseeching. More like a begging than just asking the Lord. The praying person sees his own inability and even recognizes God's ability in his life. And this causes us to come before the Lord and even to seek the help that we need. There is a story of a pastor who had grown accustomed to someone providing him with a rose every Sunday. That routine took on a dramatic new meaning when a young boy approached him after service and politely asked if he could have that little rose, the pastor knew that this flower okay, is, has destined or even destined for the trash. So he offered it to the boy instead. He asked the boy what, had planned, what he had planned to do with the used rose. The little boy replied, Sir or pastors, uh, pastor, I'm going to give it to my Lola or to my granny. My parents just separated, so they both sent me to stay with my grandmother. She is really good to me. She cooks for me and takes care of me. She has been so good that I want to give that pretty flower for loving me. The pastor said in tears as he listened. So he told the boy, you can't have this flower because it's not enough so he pointed to the large spray of fresh flowers at the altar and said please take those flowers those sprays of flowers to your granny because she deserves the very best the boy lit up with excitement and said oh what a wonderful day i asked for just one flower but i got beautiful bouquet. Our approach to God is not unlike what took place that day with his child and the pastor. So many times we come in our pain seeking a small response to our situation. But God points to a greater answer and invites us to take that instead. To give you a very comical okay, experience in the past, I remember 20 years ago, during our 1990s era of courtship, Sangapangaluyag, palang si Pastor F, our dates of courtship was so simple and even unique. Before I accepted him, okay, in fairness to him, he is so romantically, he even, uh, I think, I think he, rom he rom romantically pursued me to the point na na give in na ako. I specifically told him in, that, that my answer to him relies on the item that can be found in Christian bookstore. Last time, ang Christian bookstore, it's a very familiar place na ginakatuan, ginamon during the 20, uh, 1990s era. And I told him, find this verse. 
I don't know if it's an item, it's a book, a bookmark, or even a, 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 what do you call this, a picture frame or anything to test him of his profession of love to me. And even, okay. And one day later, he came to see me excitedly and showed me this bookmark with a verse. And true enough, this bookmark has really, okay, something like, I don't know, in plan sa ako na mind, and this should be my answer to him. And the bookmark says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So, it either he take me or, or uh, leave me or take me. So, he got me to, on, that, on that day. He took my answer and I give my answer to him and I say, uh, I love you to him too. That was, okay, see, a simple prayer, okay, a simple test of love. Sa iyong mga sutura, subong niya, laina niya niya, text, no? Ano pagid? So many things, okay? So, brothers and sisters, William MacDonald says, ordinarily, we would rather do anything than pray. But, it is only when we wait before the Lord in desperate, believing, fervent, unhurried prayer that the reviving, energizing power of the Spirit of God is poured out upon us. What sort of prayer is the Lord talking about today? It is the sincere prayer of a person who realizes his true condition. When you say to yourself, when I understand everything, I have come as a gift from God. My prayers, my ambitions, my pains, my sufferings, or even my joy will be filled with gratitude in love and praise to God. And I will cry out to God, confessing how far short I fall of His divine standards. And every day we will tell God and always remember the words of Jesus, without me, you can do nothing. Third condition of God is a call to passion, seeking His face. These words means to desire something. It is, a, it is a very similar to the fourth beatitude of Jesus Christ that says, Blessed are, the, are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. To seek God's face is to hunger for a closer walk with Him. One has said, The true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects he pursues. The question is today, what are you hungry for right now? What has your attention this morning? And whatever it is, that is your priority. Whatever it is, that is your priority. It is in effect your God, your little gods. So today, may we determine that we will have no other God before Him. May we determine that our love for Jesus Christ will drive us even to pursue Him with every fiber of our beings. A.W. Tozer said, If we yearned after God even as much as a cow yearns for her calf, we would be the worshiping and effective believers God wants us to be. If we long for God as a bride looks forward to the return of her husband, we would be a far greater force for God than we are now. One of the problems today, and even in the modern church today, is that we have ceased, we have lost our desire to see God. Often we have so many pursuits in life that are so fragmented in our devotions that we have no place for a first place in our lives. May we, the people of God, once fall in love with God to the point that He becomes the focus and the driving force of our life today. The evidence of seeking God in our lives next is repentance. And that leads me to my fourth condition, a call to purity, repentance. The phrase when it says, turn from your wicked ways, it is self-explanatory. No need to explain. I think we all can understand that statement because God wants us or wants His people to stop sinning. We are to examine our lives, identify anything that does not please the Lord or even line up with the Word of God and to eliminate them from our lives. 
What does it mean to repent? Why should we repent? In Colossians, it says, put to death. You have put to death. You have to mortify. You have to kill what is earthly in you, like sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, even anger, malice, wrath, slander, and filthy language from your lips. So even Paul uses a strong language to talk about voracious hatred of sin that we should have to put to death those or these evil desires and the inclinations of our heart. Stanley said, every week as a Christian, we see through the media, movies, videos, and even televisions. We entertain ourselves with the depictions of the very sins for which Christ has died. But what is the problem with us? In most cases, we Christians are not even have the least bit grieves God. Okay? Grieved by this. Wala na kita kahadlok o wala na kita nasubuan. We are no longer grieved by those, those movies. And that is the nature of a hard heart. Our heart is hardened today. Our mind what grieves God no longer grieves you and me. Your heart and even your mind, your mind, heart is hard today. Today, I'll give you the facts about repentance. What is repentance? How does it help us grow closer to the heart of God? First, we all need to repent and we need to keep repenting repenting because in in first john it says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive in short brothers and sisters christians we the people of god must repent not just once but regularly as a lifestyle why why as a lifestyle because there is always sin around us. We are always dealing with the word sin because of our heart. Secondly, only God's loving kindness leads us to a true repentance. Part of the reason why most of us refuse repentance or the, the sound of repentance, naga, naga, we, we irk or we, we, we don't disagree at all. Because when we hear someone telling us, especially your pastors, your parents, or even your leaders, to repent of your sin, we usually hear it with a harsh voice, right? It seems that this person, okay, is angry with us or disappointed with us in so many ways. But we least think of God's demeanor for us. Is that God correct us in a loving kindness and this is exactly what paul says god's motivation to us in romans or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that god's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance biblical repentance flows from a response to god's love and any repentance that is not responding to the love of God is not true repentance at all. It is just a fearful subjugation because of fear, not because of love. Next, repentance is acknowledgement that we have made a mockery. We laugh or we, we made a mockery of God's love. Because we do not always see our sin as a mockery to God's unrelenting and beautiful love. We don't see ourselves to be horrified or even coming to the place of admitting that our sins are abominable and disastrous. Not only to our relationship with God, but also to our relationship with those whom we loved and even to those people around us. Remember that you are not sinning only for yourself, but you are affecting people, those around you. God hates sin. He detests it. And we often forget it, right? We are all guilty of forgetting. But if we do not treat sin seriously and repent of it, it will kill us and even separate us from God. Next, 
Proverbs or even Psalm 51 provides one tangible example of true repentance. When David acknowledges his adulterous and even murderous sin in which he carries out an affair with Bathsheba and even kills her husband Uriah, we can see here how this does this psalm help us understand what true repentance is. Repentance flows from gazing on the loving kindness and the mercy of God upon David's life. And it also realizing our sin is ultimately against God. That only God can bring a restoration sa atong nga life. In applications, reawakening of our hearts starts in the heart of God. His heart today is to send His Spirit and even His power to us that we have never seen before. The fact is, before revival or a reawakening start or can come to us today, we have to be made ready through confession of sin, as what I have said earlier, to return to a holy living. And this makes us ready for our prayers to be heard from heaven. Sin in us must be dealt with. And the need in our church today, for all of us today, is repentance. Why all these things are happening to us today? Why the world is in chaos, in a mess? That leads me to my second point. Reawakening provides rewards. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and kill their own. If we were be able to meet all the conditions in Second Chronicles, then we create an atmosphere in which we can experience tremendous spiritual reward from the hand of the Lord. The word then... Then, T-H-E-N encourages us to believe that our crying to God will never be in vain. That our crying to God will be heard. In first, God will give us His attention. Then, I will hear from heaven because God knows everything we think, say, and do. So, God hears all our prayers in the sense that He knows everything. Anything or anyone ask about him. The word here does not refer only to the physical sense of hearing or even your ear. It means to listen, to pay attention, and to give heed to what someone is saying. But what happens? Sin hinders prayer. In some, if I had cherished sin, cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened and he has attended to the voice of our prayer. When sin is taken care of, of, or even sin is taken care from us, or uh, gotten from us, prayer can flow and hindered to and from the throne of God. God will not accept our prayer if we accept sin in our hearts. Second, what is the promise? Or what is the reward of God? That God will help us, that He will forgive our sin. Sin is any disobedience to God's revealed will. In fact, Christ has raised the bar by spiritual, spiritual, spiritualizing the requirements above just mere physical obedience. What is mere physical obedience that we have to follow the law during the Old Testament time? But Jesus raised the bar of spiritualizing the repentance by God looking at the heart of a person. And God wants us to be pure in heart soul not merely in our outward appearance the word forgive means pardon release it means it refers to removing the guilt of our sin and releasing the forgiveness one from the penalty for all our wrongdoings this means brothers and sisters not only our prayer line is restored but it means that we can be in a close fellowship with our God. Because nothing in this world compares with being able to have a close communion with our Father in heaven. That we can come to His presence, we can worship Him in spirit and in truth, and even we can sense His power and joy in us. Next, God will also restore what was once broken. This is the reward. When it says in verse 14, 
God will heal our land. Or even in verse 40, 15, Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in His place. In the context of God's promise to Solomon, their land refers to the promised land of God's chosen people of Israel. The word heal in this verse refers to God restoring His favor to the children of Israel by removing the consequences of their backsliding and even returning peace and prosperity with their promised land. The Lord's promise to them is that repentance equals rain. Repentance equals rain. If they will honor Him, if they will honor Him, He will honor them. If they will open their hearts, He will open the heavens. In a sense, we are in the same situation today. Our homes, our families, our church, our communities, our city, our country, and even our nations, our world. We have been devastated through a drought of spiritual blessings and power. No more spiritual desire among people. If, but if God's children will come back to Him in genuine repentance and faith, we will see our city, our family, and even our church impacted for and by the glory of God. We need that kind of reawakening. However, within our lives, there are enemies to reawaken which prevent us from experiencing God's power working in our lives. And that leads me to my third point. Reawakening exposes real enemies. And what are those enemies? I have two Ps. First P is pride. If my people will humble themselves, and this phrase deals with the area of our pride. Pride. A deadly word. In fact, the most dangerous and fatal sin that a Christian okay, had committed. The Bible condemns proud men and women in the strongest terms because the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They, they will not go unpunished. What is spiritual pride? Spiritual pride is hidden pit in many unsuspecting Christians have fallen. Okay? The first and the worst cause of errors that abound in our day to day. Why there are they fighting? Why there are chaos? Why there are social unrest? Because people are so proud of themselves. The main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those, not the backslidden, but of those who are zealous for the advancement of Christ. It means for us, for pastors, for leaders, for Christians, for faithful ones. And even Jesus addressed this fatal flaw in his most familiar parable. When, the, when he said in his parable, the Pharisees stood up and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are extortioners and just adulterers or even as this publican. While the publican standing afar off would not lift so much of his eyes to heaven. But he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. According to Jesus, it was the humble publican who went home justified. And this publican is forgiven. The Pharisees isn't. Spiritual pride is deadly. And it is the ruin even of the Laodicean church. Remember the Laodicean church? When a person or a church says, I am rich and increased with goods, there's nothing more than, a, than that's, that, that's nothing more than spiritual pride. And God has something to say about that. That we are really poor, not rich. Wretch and blind and naked. And we, do, we don't even know it. Spiritual pride takes in many forms and shapes. And some of which I will mention today. The spiritually proud person is full of light already and feels that he does not need instruction so he is ready to despise the offer of it it means he doesn't want to be saved of, uh, from anybody and i am guilty of it in fact one week ago i went to to robinson we are asked to sit in a table of two but i prefer to, to sit together with Jen. So, three, tatlo kami. 
But the, the security guard came and even asked us, Mom, you are not allowed to sit together in three because we, 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 we are, we are, we are uh, practicing health protocol. But to my, to my, to, uh, because of my pride, I, I, I told her, we are staying in one, we, in one household. So how can you to tell us that we are not allowed? So I, 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 I keep on insisting okay, to my entitlement. But then I realized later that it was proud. I am so proud I am because I, want, I, I don't want to follow instruction at all. And I was guilty of it. But a humble person is like a little child who easily receives instruction. Next, proud people became the greatest fault finder. It causes us to speak of other person's sins. Their enmity against God and even His people with laughter or even with an air of contempt. We despise them. While the humble Christian sees much evil in his own heart and so is concerned about it that he is not apt to be very busy with other hearts. Next, spiritually proud people often speak of almost everything they see in others in a harshest and even more severe way. We say of the other's opinion, conduct, advice, silence, actions, sin, that all, that all of it from the devil. We usually say it towards wicked people and the worst it. We even say it to our true children of God and also towards our pastors and leaders. But the humble persons, humble person, however, their exhortation to fellow Christians who have sinned are given in a loving and a humble manner. And they treat others with as much humility and gent gentleness as Christ, who is infinitely above them. Next, spiritual pride put a pretenses. We act different in external appearance to assume a different way of speaking, continence, or even our behaviors. Yet, a humble Christian does not delight in being different or differences sake. Yet, he is inclined to become all things to all men, to yield to others, to conform to them, and to please them in all but sin. Proud people are hungry for attention. We want to take all the respect that is paid to us. And it becomes unnatural for us to expect such treatment and to take notice. If that person fails to do so, we get angry. However, a humble person thinks he needs help from everybody and under a sense of misery, entreats and beseeches others to appeal or even but a spiritual pride commands and warns with authority and the bible even replete with the examples of men who would be king a person who wants to be king and kings who wanted to be divine and that's the case the pride of position haman remember haman who had recently received a promotion of high honor from the king he became angry with Mordecai because the devout Jew would not bow down before him. Pride, a distorted mirror that obstructs clear thinking and reason, allowed Haman to see only himself. Filled with conceit, Haman thought in his heart, would whom the king delight to honor more than me? Because the king had told him, what should be done for the man? The king's delight to honor. The Bible says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. Haman's story is a great example of ultimate payout of pride. What happened? He was hung on the gallows he had built for Mordecai. Instead of hanging Mordecai. And Mordecai, the Jew, was given the honor instead of Haman. Commanded to honor the man his pride so desperately wanted to murder. If we exalt ourselves, striving for position and honor, we will be humbled by God. Are we today, I ask you, burdened with spiritual pride? Are we proud of our knowledge of Bible doctrine? Though we go to church mocking those don't, who don't go to church or even those who committed sins or offended by us, be warned of this spirit of your heart and even the reason why we do all these things. 
bride is the seed that Satan planted even to get Jesus nailed to the cross. Remember, brothers and sisters, it was because of bride that Jesus was nailed to the cross. It offended the chief priest bride that Jesus threatened their prominence among the people. So they killed Jesus. Pride also leads to all other sins, and that is prayerlessness, my last point. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, let's be honest today. We all struggle to pray at some point in our lives, but do you know that there are far-reaching consequences to our prayerlessness? So when we stop praying, you block God from taking charge of your life and away give access to the enemy to destroy us. What exactly is prayerlessness? Prayerlessness is a symptom of pride. Symptom of pride or a cousin of pride. Prayerlessness demonstrates our independence. Prayerlessness says, I do not need to call on the Lord. I can make it just fine without His aid. Prayerlessness does not say, He is all I need, but I am all I need. It relies on yourself and the resources of yourself that can produce and even refuses to listen on Jesus alone. So surely, we don't need to pray. But remember, apart from Jesus, we are nothing. Prayerlessness is a sin because the Bible calls it a sin. When Samuel in 1 Samuel says, Moreover, as for me, far be it that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray. For Samuel knew that it would be sin for him if he did not continue praying for Israel despite of their sin. As Christians today, just like Samuel, we are priests of God. We are not just only priests as pastors here, but all are we are priests and have the calling of prayer upon us. If we do not pray in Jesus' name for those he has commanded us and burdened us to pray, we must say with Samuel that it is a sin against the Lord. Today, like never before, people around us, even our family, desperately needs our prayers. Are we praying for our leaders? Are we praying for our mayors, our, our president, or even are praying for our pastors? We have no right to complain about them if we have not been praying for them. What about our pastors? They need our prayers because pastors and ministers fight a major spiritual battle. Prayerlessness reveals our, our unwillingness to let God work in our lives. It is in prayer that we allow God to mess in our lives. It is in our personal prayer experience that we wrestle with God. Our will is broken. Our desire is broken. And we surrender to His will. It is also through prayer that His grace is received. Our daily bread, our, our wisdom, our life, and all the blessings that we receive. If we don't pray, it means that we are unwilling to let God work in our life. Prayerlessness reveals our unbelief. The Word says, How then sh shall they call Him in whom they have not believed? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. If we knew for certain that if we ask God for something, we would get it, wouldn't we pray? And not to spend time with the Lord reveals we don't really believe in God. We'll hear and answer our prayers. And lastly, prayerlessness opens the door for other sins. Not to pray leaves us wide open to temptations, sin, and failure. We all experience times of battles and temptations with our flesh. But Jesus exhorted us, watch and pray. Watch and pray. If we don't watch and pray, if we don't keep praying, our armor is useless and even the great sword of the Spirit will become dull. Someone said, the church has many organizers. But few agonizers. Many who pay, pay their tithes, pay their offerings, but few pray. Many resters, but few wrestlers. 
Many who are enterprising, but few are interceding. In the matter of effective praying, never so many left so much to so few. The church is dying on its feet because it is not living on its knee. Pride and prayerlessness are all real enemies to God, sending real awakening in our hearts. Do any of these two characterize our spiritual life today or even at this time? I ask you, are you a proud person? Are you prayerless? But this would only be made possible through Jesus Christ. And that leads me to my last point. Reawakening is all realized in Christ. If we are honest today with ourselves today, we will know that our lives do not shine out with enough evidence of the faith the way we profess. What was once alive seems dead now within. We all know we have to reawaken our hearts again, but we have failed. We find it difficult to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek God's faith, and even to repent. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Son of God, came to the rescue. He came to break the darkness of 400 years between the era of Malachi and the era of Matthew. He came to break the divine silence and even the divine darkness by living a life of humility, prayerfulness, passionate seeking of God's faith, and even sinlessness. As such, His life, the life of Jesus, shone as the brightest light into the darkened heart of the people living at the time. Yet, the sinful people crucified Jesus on the cross. On the cross, Jesus experienced darkness for all our sins of pride, prayerlessness, and even lack of desire for God. Above all, he experienced the ultimate darkness of being abandoned by his father. He suffered all this darkness so that our hearts today, my hearts today, will be awakened to his humility, his prayerfulness, and his hunger for his presence. On our own, we can't fulfill it. All the requirements that I have mentioned earlier for this awakening. It is only to the measure that we have to catch the degree of how much Jesus Christ has suffered on the cross for all our failures to meet all those requirements. Can we then appropriate Christ's humility, purposeness, and wholeness to our own life and even to awaken our dark and dead hearts today? After all, Christ's death on the cross had already paid for all our present sins, for all the present things within our hearts. The Bible says, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Jesus Christ, our greatest light, has already died for every sin that makes our heart to slumber and dead. He has died for you and me, so that our heart today can be awakened can be revived and made alive in Him. He has overcome the ultimate death on the cross for His resurrection and released His Spirit at the Pentecost so that we can do it one more time, one more time to be reawakened from our, from our dead and let our heart be filled with faith and repentance, turn and humble ourselves and call upon His name. In conclusion, reawakening our hearts can happen only through humbling, praying, seeking, and turning to God. Yes, there are enemies, but can be defeated. Because Jesus Christ, our greatest light, died for every sin that makes our hearts slumber, can be awakened and made alive again. If my people here are called by my name, humble ourselves and pray, He will hear our prayer. Repentance is for the child of God. Before I end, let me share with you my experience and how God exposed my heart's intent and how it affects my life and even those around me. As a servant of God, I wasn't aware of the devil's devices and scheme to rob of my joy and peace that eventually put my spiritual fervor, fervor in jeopardy. I fell into one of the enemies of the slumbering heart, spiritual pride which many unsuspecting Christians fell into this pit. My pride and my rebellion 
became my downfall as a servant of God. God dealt with me severely. I went through the wilderness in a season of exile for three months, four years ago. And during that period, God quickened in my heart the severity and the seriousness of my sin. I humbly admitted my sin before God and men. I bore the consequence and even asked God to renew my heart again. But one thing God assured me, that the greatness of my sin cannot be compared to the greatness of God's forgiveness and loving kindness to me. I took the stand to seek God fervently. Then a divine exchange took place on my behalf. I can, I can, I can sense a spiritual reawakening and what makes it possible because Jesus came alongside with me during that period of wilderness journey. God heard my prayer and finally restored what was once broken and dead. I humbled myself before God under the mighty hand of God. I stood firm to this promise. I humbled myself. I prayed. I seek with faith and turned from my wicked ways. And God heard from heaven. What about you? Are you willing to come before Him? Humble yourself. Pray. Seek His faith and turn from your sin. Or are you willing to be or to do whatever it takes to see real awakening to come into your life? Do you love Jesus more than life itself? I ask you today, is your love growing and burning brighter than anything else in your life? Or has your love for Jesus Christ has become cold? Examine your heart today. Be honest with God. As the song, as the hymn song says, awaken my heart to know thy love and to love thee in return. Freely flowing from an awakened heart. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, as I was asking earlier, what is the greatest need, not just of the world, but our greatest need today? It is not vaccine. It is not the disappearance of this COVID but it is our spiritual progress because if we ask ourselves after this pandemic what will be left with you? Ano ang mabilin sa imo? After this pandemic do you still have will you still have the spirituality? Or maybe for some of us because of this pandemic Instead of progressing spiritually, we have declined spiritually. May I speak to some of the leaders here? I also speak to myself. Have we allowed this pandemic? Have we allowed our business? Have we allowed our professions? Have we allowed our schedule to steal, to take away what God has prepared for us, for you? Have you allowed those things, those legitimate things in your life to draw you away from God? And if you really search within your heart to check yourself, you have declined. Some of us, we just want to rest. We just want to have a vacation from serving God. But don't you realize that it hurts God? It hurts God so much. It hurts the Lord. Jesus did not turn back. He did not turn back from His calling. He pursued. 
He pursued his calling. He pursued his purpose until he said it is finished. Now for, for some of us here today, maybe you think that you have done, you, you have made it, you have made it, you have done it, you have done enough. Frankly speaking, you have not died yet. You are not dead yet. What happened to you was just a pinch. A pinch. Kusi lang ang natabo sa imo nga pain. And you want to give up already. You want to turn back already. You want to have your vacation already. And thinking that one day, it will be fine. You will be fine. You will go back. But I just want to tell you, spiritual decline is very dangerous. And the reason for it is what we have heard from Pastor Henry is our pride. We are so proud. We cannot take correction. We cannot take discipline. We cannot take pain because we want comfort for our lives. We, are, we want comfort for ourselves. But remember this, we should not put what the Lord has done for us into the waste basket. What He did for us was very precious, was very important. I hope that we see ourselves as God sees us. Don't, don't look at yourself. Don't see yourself as your pastor or your leader sees you. Because some of our darkness may not be visible to our pastors and to our leaders. Begin to see yourself as God sees you. We need to be re reawakened from our slumber. There is a need to be reawakened today. God has been trying to awaken the world gently and nobody wakes up. Nobody woke up. Now, He is shaking the world. If you have been sleeping, slum slumbering for so long, you must be reawakened by the gentle voice and call of God for your life. Or else, He will shake you. By allowing this world to shake you, now, you are shaking in fear because you did not wake up when God called you gently. And for so many of us here, maybe you have experienced God's kindness, but you think you are entitled to it and you did not respond to God in a way He expected you to respond to Him. I was struck by this statement earlier the true worth of a man is to be measured on the objects he pursues the object you pursue is the kind of a man you are let me repeat the object the things you pursue in life is the kind of person you are if you don't pursue anything in your life then you are can I say, a useless man? If you have no goal, you have no aim. You are unstable. You are a useless person. If you pursue God, you are a godly person. If you pursue the world, you are a worldly person. What is the object you pursue today? But I just want to encourage many of you here. Jesus went through the darkest time so that we can be reawakened from our darkest moments today. God wants, to reawake, re, God wants us to awake again. Reawaken your hearts. Shall we all stand? If you, th if you think, if you feel that you are done, because the devil may come to you that, and, say, and say you are done, you are finished. But God is not yet finished with you. God or Jesus only finished His work on the cross. 
but He is not yet finished with you until today. If you respond to Him, be reawakened, be rekindled again. I just want to encourage many of you here. You, are, you, are, you, are, you have been declining, declining spiritually, but now God wants to reawaken your heart. Let this song be your prayer today, Awaken My Heart. Hallelujah. Let us just raise our hands in surrender to the Lord today. As the scripture says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. To love and adore the oh my Lord, awaken my heart to pour out before the oh my Lord, awaken my heart to know the love and to love. to raise our hands we will surrender 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 again surrender again to the lord Oh Lord, please light the fire. 
surrenders to the Lord. Because God sees your heart. God sees your heart. And He's doing something about it right now. God is doing something about your heart right now. If some of us here, if you have fallen, if you have fallen so far, and you feel that right now you are living in darkness, I just want to tell you that God is calling you right now through Jesus Christ. God has sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, for you. You are one of those lost of the hundred sheep that God has been taken care of. And you are that one lost sheep. That one lost sheep is so important that Jesus came to find that lost ship that lost ship is you is you jesus came so that he may bring you back to the fold of god come back to the fold of god return my people return to the lord god wants us to return to him father today we return to you like the lost ship we, fall in, we fell into danger and the enemy, the wolf, attacked us. But Jesus, you are our good shepherd. You brought us back into the fold of God. Today, you have reawakened our hearts so that we can love you, so that we can return to you. God, I pray that, Lord, you will continue to just minister who among you today, you have not received Jesus into your heart yet. You have not received Jesus into your life as your Savior and Lord yet. You may be here for quite some time already, but you have not said a sinner's prayer. And today, you know that God is speaking to you. you today, you feel that God loves you so much. Today you see the sacrifice of Jesus for you and you are thankful, you are grateful to it. And because of that, 
you want to let Jesus you want to let Jesus into your life nobody looking around if you want to receive Jesus into your heart right now as your Savior and Lord kindly raise your hand very fast is there anyone Do you want to receive Jesus into your heart is there anyone yes the Lord sees that hand please put it down anyone else anymore yes today is the day today is your day today will be the greatest day of your history the greatest day of your life when Jesus comes into you please repeat this prayer after me repeat this prayer audibly loud Heavenly Father I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins I am so sorry forgive me I was away from you in my sins right now I acknowledge my sin I acknowledge my uncleanliness and I ask you Jesus to wash me with your blood I come under you right now under the cross and let the blood that comes from the cross cleanse me and wash my sins away I receive you Jesus as my Savior I receive you as my Lord come into my heart right now live within me I will obey you I will love you and I will serve you thank you for dying on the cross for me in Jesus name father today we just want to thank you Lord for your word God we need to be reawakened again because we are alive in Christ we are alive in Christ father we pray that you'll continue to just speak to us and always remind us oh God that we need to progress in our spiritual life in our spiritual walk we thank you for your goodness today we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus name we pray amen amen praise God you may all